Hello and welcome everybody. This is uh, Robert Adici and this is Bone, Stone, and Obsidian. Today, unfortunately, we do not have Wayne with us. He is uh, off parenting. He's got a little one, a, a little tiny one that just came pretty recently within the past couple of months. So he is very busy these days. But do not worry. You don't have to listen to me the whole time. We've also got Jesse Heinig with us. Uh, Jesse, say hello. Hello, Robert, and to the whole audience out there. I'm very pleased to be able to join you today. Yeah, so, uh, you know, since Wayne has been busy and I've got little kids and sometimes I'm busy and sometimes I can't be here, we wanted to make sure that, you know, we can have a uh, show going on regularly now. So what we're going to start doing is having some additional co-hosts, maybe some rotating people. So if you have some, if you think you have something to say about Dark Sun um, and you want to be on the show let us know. Uh, give us, uh, shoot us an email to obsidian at athos.org. And if you, you know, tell us what you want to talk about, like th things that you're interested in Dark Sun. And when we have a topic on, uh, you know, on the show, we will uh, send you an email and we'll chat. So Jesse, we invited you here. Uh, we're still wrapping up the fifth edition topic uh, that we, we started. We went through two episodes and this is Hopefully the final <laughs> episode, we'll see. Uh, but right now this is scheduled to be, uh, you know, we think we'll get through, through this episode, but we're basically going through the, um, the Dark Sun rules book, the original Dark Sun rules book from front to back and kind of saying how things kind of would be converted. And we're talking about, you know, like how we would convert them, why we think things need to be a certain way and um, just kind of our opinion and, and you know, maybe, maybe also maybe what Wizards of the Coast might do based on kind of their track record and whatnot. But before we get into that, Jesse, why don't you tell us, like, you know, how long have you been a Dark Sun fan? How did you get into Dark Sun? That kind of thing. Well, I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> so I picked up Dark Sun while I was in college, back when it first released. It actually came out at the tiny little store near the little university that I was going to. And I had been playing Dungeons and Dragons for several years already. And when Dark Sun released, I saw that and said to myself, wow, this looks different and interesting i've got to get this immediately and i dropped 20 bucks on the original box set which i still have today on my desk in reasonably good condition <laughs> all of the corners are still intact nice and uh i immediately contacted a bunch of my buddies at the the campus and said hey i'm gonna run this new D, &D game it's called dark sun it's super amazing and we played all throughout my time at the college uh, and I kept it and continued adding to my collection as books came out and just sort of voraciously absorbed all things Dark Sun. It really resonated with me. And that probably was a slight influence a few years later on when I went to work on the original Fallout uh, video game uh, as one of the nice. designers. And of course, that's a post-apocalyptic setting as well. And so I was at that point deeply immersed in the idea of these <laughs> post-apocalyptic desert worlds with resource scarcity and, and harsh environments and difficult choices for survival. And I have remained a fan of Dark Sun ever since. I ran a Dark Sun game using 3rd edition rules for several years ago. I've got all of the Dark Sun 4th edition books on my shelf as well, which is handy for reference, and there's some phenomenal art in there and great information about the Sorcerer Monarchs. And I've been running 5th edition Dark Sun for over a year with my regular group at the office where I work. So I have thoughts. Nice, nice. Well, that's what we're all about. We're all about thoughts here. So let's dig in. And what do you think, talking about your thoughts, like when you, I, I know you are personally working on your own conversion for 5th edition. So what do you think is probably like your overall guiding principle to converting Dark Sun to 5th edition? Interesting question. So 5th edition is, a, in many ways, a very streamlined edition of Dungeons & Dragons. It's, it says, okay, instead of having lots of very specific rules and, and edge cases and, and high levels of detail, it's like, here's a very basic way to approach adventuring and get a lot of this cruft out of the, the way. And I think that this is an interesting approach. It's really good for groups that are not full of people who really want to engage with that super crunchy material or for groups where you have players who are more interested in their story development or who just aren't really fans of math, you know, maybe people who are a math <laughs> enumerate or have dyslexia or, or other difficulties like that, and they want to play a game that's easier to grasp. And so taking that as sort of the mechanical foundation, then the idea is, okay, Dark Sun 
is a setting. It's a set of ideas and a set of themes and moods and story types. And how do you fit those into this sort of streamlined game system? And one of the things that's telling about this, and, and we've discussed on the, the Dark Sun Facebook group and on Dark Sun Reddit and whatnot, mm -hmm. is that the second edition original box set, as you mentioned in your previous streams, is itself a conversion of second edition. It's here's different rules for fighters and different rules for elves. All these things work differently. And so the idea of taking fifth edition and converting it to make it support Dark Sun is not that far fetched. When people say, oh, fifth edition is not good for Dark Sun, it's like, well, <laughs> maybe tweak the things that don't fit and make them fit. Right. You know, second edition core didn't have rules about desperation when you're suffering from dehydration, but Dark Sun core does. So if you feel that that's important, then find a way to include that in your fifth edition game. But by following the ideas of this is important to a Dark Sun story, and here's how you can implement it in the streamlined fifth edition rules system. I think that's really the happy marriage to look for is to say, how can I make this feel like a streamlined game using the systems, the simplified systems that 5th edition has created uh, and the interesting choices that it gives us, but also create that idea of these are the, the feelings that you get from being in the dark sun sitting, these sense of desperation, of scarcity, of tough choices, transformation, environmental devastation, all those things. Nice, nice. Well, let's dig in then. Um, so we're going to dig right back in where we left off with Wayne with chapter nine, which is the combat chapter. So there's lots of combat in Dark Sun. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the first things it talks about is arena combat. And this is, you know, something I really loved uh, about Dark Sun is, you know, the whole gladiator vibe from it, um, which was greatly expanded in, um, in the complete gladiators handbook as right. well. So all of these, you know, there's talks about a bunch of different ways uh, to a bunch of different kind of kinds of combat you can have in an arena. And I think all of these things, you know, you can easily sort of, uh, you know, put into uh, into fifth edition. A lot of it is more just like advice rather than specific details. Yeah, this is like structuring your gladiator style stories. A, a remastered edition of the original 1960 Spartacus was just released in October. So mm. people who are interested in gladiatorial stuff can look at the OG original gladiators uh, if they want to pick up that movie. <laughs> Four hours with, you know, some classic actors and on location shoots and whatnot the famous i am spartacus scene at the end or oh, watch yeah. some of the modern interpretations like the spartacus tv show that's on cable but if you remember the dark sun video games that came out from ssi mm -hmm. the first one shattered lands started off with your characters being slaves in a gladiatorial stable and having to fight several matches and then in between matches you met other people in the stables you learned about the situation in the city mm -hmm. while you tried to formulate your escape yeah. so obviously Gladiatorial combat and matches is, is a great way to structure some interesting fights for your game. And as a way to start a campaign, it's a, a great idea because you can then completely control the kinds of encounters that the players are going to face. So you can make sure that their first few encounters give them this memorable idea of, oh, we're not just fighting orcs and fire beetles. These monsters are strange and everything has psychic powers. Mm -hmm. And you can generate that sort of social difficulty of okay you guys are slaves or your gladiators that are working freelance for a particular house being sponsored and then they're going to tell you inevitably at some point that you have to throw a match <laughs> but as the dm you can decide what sort of encounters they're going to have what sort of weapons they have to use and give them all of these sort of structured challenges because instead of it being random encounters that people meet in the wilderness it's whatever the the arena masters decide is going to make entertainment for the masses so you have an excuse to do things with weird terrain or things where the players are all using bows and have no choice in the matter or nobody gets armor and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Did you ever run a game like that where you uh, you know, started in, in the arena? Oh, absolutely. And when you first start up a Dark Sun game and people start to get the idea for what it is, there's always someone who wants to play a gladiator. <laughs> so you've got a built-in hook. Someone is going to do that thing. And then you can say, okay, players, how would you feel about everyone here being thrown in the mix with the gladiator and the gladiator is doing the heavy lifting while the preserver and the druid and whatnot are just trying to survive? And an interesting variant on that is you take a gladiator who is going to be involved in the games and you play the gladiators getting owned or sponsored by some noble house 
and all of the other PCs are sort of ancillary characters involved with the house. You've got the trader who does all of their, their trade yeah. deals, and you've got the psionicist who's the house telepath, and you've got the cleric mm-hmm. who's their mercenary spellcaster or whatnot. And then they go to the games, and occasionally the gladiator uh, has a session, and a neat twist you can do is say, okay, the the gladiator PC is going to play his character, and all of the other players are going to play the monsters or the enemy gladiators for this match. And then at the end of the match, he goes down to the baths, he gets cleaned up, he gets healed by the cleric, and then you go back to the noble house, and you play all the, the political side of the game. So there's lots of opportunities. Yeah, for sure. One of the campaign ideas I had uh, recently for my Patreon group, because we just switched to a new campaign, I guess at the beginning, of the middle of the year, was a gladiator campaign that was one of the pitches. So the idea was basically that, you know, in Dark Sun, you have the, uh, you have the character trees. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was that, you know, half of the characters, half the players' characters are gladiators, and the other half are, like you said, you know, kind of ancillary characters or characters that are just involved in the house somewhat. So you can get kind of both sides of that, just like you were talking about. Yeah, that's that's a great way to do it, too. If everyone has a gladiator, then everyone has a character that they can play when they want to be involved in the matches. And mm-hmm. uh, a really amusing way to structure this that makes it very easy for the DM is you just you lift wholesale stuff from professional wrestling. <laughs> there's there is a championship belt. Everyone wants it. They fight. And you aren't necessarily in control of who your matches are going to be. And you have grudges and alliances and heels and faces. It writes itself. You can get several levels of interesting campaigning out of this. For sure. For sure. Well, let's uh, let's move on a little bit. The next um, topic here is battling undead in Dark Sun, and undead is one of the reasons why I also love Dark Sun because they're so interesting. You know, it talks about how you have your you have a lot of free willed undead. It talks about how there are kind of no regular mo- undead. There's no ghouls, shadows, whites, gas, wraith, mummies, etc. Because Dark Sun has their own specific undead, which was great. You know, after. Um, in the first years, Tim Brown, I think, wrote uh, a few articles that had a bunch of different kinds of undead, and then those continued to expand in the uh, Monsters Compendium. So I love all the undead. You get the Kaishargas, Raigs, Dwarven Banshees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The field is wide open. And the encouragement to make your undead unique, each one has a personality mm-hmm. and they're undead because of a specific thing that went wrong, means that your players really have to be on their toes because they don't know in advance oh, this thing is going to drain a level every time it hits us and we need silver weapons. They don't know. Right, right. Yeah, we, uh, in, my, in my my game, they recently, somewhat recently, ran into, um, you know, ran into a Dwarven Banshee, although they didn't know what it was right away. And so there was some, you know, interaction there. It wasn't just like, uh, it's a ghost, it's screaming at you. There was some interaction and that was good. They also ran into a fail, which is like this kind of one that just likes, you know, likes to eat a lot of food yeah. and stuff like that. But there was interaction like that, you know, so that they really, uh, my players said that they really enjoy kind of interacting with them. You know, things aside from like, you know, usually like whites or vampires, most undead are sort of just things to be killed in, in regular D&D. Right. But in, in this case, you get to make an, an undead that thinks and it has some sort of a motivation, which means it's got a story behind it. And that lets you mm-hmm. play all sorts of interesting angles. Like this person suffered from a, a horrible betrayal or... They were involved in some sort of psionic experiment and went horribly wrong and they blew their own brain out and then became undead or whatnot. <laughs> and and this yeah, is something yeah. that goes all the way to the highest tiers of Dark Sun when you see, of course, Dregoth. Mm-hmm. You've got serious undead going on that have their own personal story. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the next part is uh, looks about uh, character death. Character He's basically death. saying, like, you can die. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it talks about an optional rule, which is hovering on death's door. Now that's sort of been sort of baked into fifth edition. Mm-hmm. Would you make any changes um, to that for fifth edition? Yeah, for for the Dark Sun games that I've run, I have had uh, some more urgency, and uh, I think that that's the important thing to get. Is for some players, they like a really challenge oriented game where it's like playing a, a roguelike on the PC, or there's elements of poker. There's some luck and there's some skill. You are you're given a hand. And you have to do the best you can with what you're dealt and rely on a little bit of luck and a little bit of cunning and some bluffs. And maybe you'll live and maybe you won't. And for those sorts of players, character death is not a hurdle. It's just sort of a, oh, shucks, I got dealt a pair of twos this time. 
this happens. All right, next hand, let's see what moves on. And and of course, the character tree is a way to sort of mm -hmm. deal with that. Okay, your character died. Bring in your replacement right. now. Right. For other players, they they develop a, a character and they're like, I want to see what the story is of where this character goes and what happens. You know, you watch Spartacus, and in the end, he gets captured and crucified and he dies horribly. But that's the end. You read Conan's stories, uh, you know, another sword and sandal genre that's influential on Dark Sun, and you don't read a story where Conan just dies halfway through, and then it's like, oh, and I guess now we're going on another character. It's, uh, it's, it's a story that is supposed to have a payoff. And so in those cases, you're building a game where death is a threat, but it's because you made some sort of a bad choice or because someone was forced into a hard position and maybe your character had to make a sacrifice or pay a price, and that could lead to death. In 5th edition, the DMG has a set of optional rules for suffering injuries. And I've found that if you really want to give people that, that sense of, oh, it's really hurting to, to go to zero hit points, you give someone an injury every time that they mm -hmm. have to make a, a death saving throw. Every time that the, you go to zero hit points, and then each round thereafter, you get an injury. So you don't want to go to zero hit points, and you really don't want to sit there for several rounds. Nice. Yeah, that's a great idea. Another mechanic that really works well with this is anytime you go to zero hit points and come back, you gain a level of exhaustion. And this might not seem like it's a huge deal, but exhaustion takes a long rest to get rid of. So mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you got to, okay, you get the character up and then you got to get to a safe place. You got to rest. And for a long rest to work and people miss this, you got to have food and water. And in Dark Sun, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So you could be sitting on a level of exhaustion for a couple of days, even if the cleric is able to heal you magically, if you don't have enough water in your party for you to get the benefits of the long rest. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, yeah. And by the time you've accumulated three levels of exhaustion, you start taking disadvantage on your attack rolls. This is really, really bad news for mm -hmm. you. And that compounds if you use rules for heat exhaustion and you make it so that players are able to accumulate a lot more exhaustion rapidly for fighting during the day while they're wearing armor and whatnot. Right, right. Exhaustion starts becoming a really nasty stick. And the great thing about that is that it helps to mitigate the one of the problems in 5th edition of characters fall down and then they get back up. And they fall down and they get back up. Mm -hmm. I ran in and I was attacking all the sligs and I missed. And I get dropped to zero hit points. And then the cleric, as a bonus action, does healing word from 60 feet away and suddenly I'm on my feet again. <laughs> right. No penalty. Yeah. Um, now, every time you drop, you take an injury, you take a level of exhaustion, you're going to be a little more cautious about your mm -hmm, advance mm -hmm. into the middle of all the scrabs. Yeah, yeah, those are those are great ideas. So the next section here is something that I feel like we're going to talk about for a long time. Uh, so waging wars, you know, one of the cool things about Dark Sun was that initially it was kind of tied into the battle system. Yeah. And the battle system uh, in second edition was like, TSR's attempt to make a kind of a war game out of D and D, mm -hmm. and uh, they they try to really push that by by tying it in. And uh, Tim Brown's Dragon Kings, you know, um, had a lot yep. of stats for Dark Sun battle system stuff. So, however, that was some that's something that's been completely and utterly dropped from Fifth mm -hmm. Edition. We've only recently seen. Well, actually, I take that back. There was a there was an Unearthed Arcana at some point that had a small yes, uh, like system for kind of waging wars. Five pages or so. Yeah, yeah. And then somewhat recently, uh, you know, Matt Colville has put out his Strongholds and Followers, which has a little warfare, but then he also just finished his, um, uh, what is it called? Kingdoms and Warfare Kickstarter, which, you know, will be out next year. And that'll have, yeah, that'll have a lot more detail. I, I remember when he was working on this for third edition back in the uh, day. Nice. So what do you think about that? Like, do you think... Personally, I think that, that it, it's something that this world needs, even though like that wasn't included in 4th edition at all. What do you think about it for 5th edition? I think that it's highly dependent on the dynamic of what your group wants to do, but there are important reasons to play it up and to at least address it and say, hey, you should consider having these sorts of things go on. And, and there's several reasons for that. First is the fighter class. The fighter, as you've discussed previously in 2nd edition, Dark Sun, they get a bunch of special abilities for leading troops and building siege equipment and things like that. And if you don't address this, then the fighter just feels like a sort of a second-rate melee combatant compared to the gladiator, who's the gladiator's an right. expert at just yeah, murdering yeah, one yeah. other guy or a couple dudes, whereas the fighter is supposed to contrast that by being the, the lord of the battlefield in massive warfare. If you have no mass combat, then that really makes the fighter feel like a little lackluster. Mm -hmm. 
Second is, it's one of the sword and sandal tropes. I mentioned Spartacus before, and Spartacus, a huge chunk of it is that he leads this slave uprising where a massive army of followers rise to his side. It starts with gladiators and then other slaves that they liberate as they're tramping across the Italian peninsula. And uh, this is a, a huge part of the game. The idea that the, the players can amass a, a military force and they can stand against the military power of other groups that would try to attack them. A, a really common thread I've seen in a lot of Dark Sun campaigns is the idea of, oh, the PCs have become protectors of this little village out in the waste somewhere that's self-sufficient. And it's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is kind of a nice place to live because there's no Templars, there's no oppressive security apparatus, no sorcerer or monarch, <laughs> and they can sort of run the show. But the problem with that when you get to mid-level is that other groups start looking at what you got and they want to take it. And you got people coming to attack you. You got sorcerer monarch right. saying, Templars, take the army and go capture everyone in that village and we'll use them to pay the dragon's levy. And so the mass combat gives you a way to resolve these sorts of situations and make the players feel like they're in charge of of dealing with these world-shaping events. And the higher level you get in Dark Sun, the more world-shaping your characters Mm -hmm. get. The game at the high end really leans on themes of transformation. For spellcasters, it's personal. You turn into some sort of advanced Mm -hmm. being. But for warrior types, it's external. You're changing the world by becoming a ruler. And people flock to your banner, whether you're trying to be a leader or not. They say, this person can make things different, and I'm going to believe that they can make things better. And suddenly, you got a thousand dudes with swords following you around, chanting your name and waving your flag. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, the next little section here talks about followers. You know, you kind of already touched on that. There's, you know, Darkson has a bunch of cool had a bunch of cool uh, ways in uh, Dragon Kings, uh, different followers you could get that were right. you know, different from uh, your classical ones. So that was, that was real cool. And I, I, you know, I would really love to see some of that brought into fifth edition. Will they do it? I don't know. I would, I would be surprised if they did, but uh, I hope to see it for sure. Yeah. Fifth edition is pretty light on a lot of the, the end game stronghold and follower type stuff. And that's why Matt was able to build a niche out of it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if you're going to, play up that sort of mass combat then you got to play up okay who's your army and where did they come from and you got to at least give some guidance about all right your fighter has a whole bunch of light archers or kank cavalry or you did a favor for a gith tribe that was probably a mistake but now they're following you around going blood for the blood god <laughs> right so a lot of times you know in in darks and here it says like when you get your followers sometimes like they don't have equipment um and so that sort of leads into the next section uh, on piecemeal armor, I think we talked a little bit about it in, in the equipment uh, section before, but uh, how do you think, or do you think they would do uh, piecemeal armor in 5th edition? I think it's actually really simple to do piecemeal armor in 5th ed, because 5th edition is really about streamlining stuff, but one of the ways that they streamline things is there's a lot of cases you get half of a particular bonus or double a particular bonus, and you see that a lot. Uh, the, the primary example is on the bard class, where you get jack-of-all-trades, where you get half your proficiency bonus on any skill that you're not proficient in, and expertise, where you get double your proficiency bonus in any skill that you mm-hmm. have expertise in. And I think that a likely solution to piecemeal armor is to follow that same barometer and say, okay, you have piecemeal leather armor, that counts as half of a suit of armor, and so you get half of the AC bonus. So, say, studded leather is AC 12 in 5th edition, so if you have piecemeal studded leather, you're AC 11 and you're floating half the weight, so 13 pounds turns into seven and a half, Mm -hmm. and half the price. Super streamlined, and then it becomes slightly more complex if you want to mix and match. So you go, I've got partial scale and partial studded leather. I get one point of AC from the partial studded leather, I get two points of AC from the partial scale. The armor category is treated as the heaviest armor I'm wearing. So I'm wearing partial scale, so I'm treated as wearing medium armor. I have disadvantage on my stealth checks, because scale gives you that. So you ultimately, you want to get the, the heaviest armor that you can. A full suit of scale is better than some scale and some studded leather. But if you got nothing else, that studded leather is giving you a point of armor class, you might as well put it on. Nice, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good way to do it. I think we talked, or I talked about this before, but the way I, I kind of did it was to have some ar- armor properties that kind of, you know, if you had a piecemeal armor property, then it's, um, let's see, what did it do? So that it gave you any suit of armor that's been damaged or repaired becomes piecemeal. Found armor is piecemeal, and armor that gains a piecemeal property can only be repaired up to its original AC 
it reduces sale price by half. So, right. you know, it still is damage. And I also had some other rules for damaging armor, which I know, like you said, it's, you know, yeah, it makes yeah. it a little bit more complicated, but um, that's the kind of game I want to run. Now, would they do that? You know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they would kind of go that far. I don't think they would, but something I liked. Yeah, I, I think that's a little more heavy weight than they would mm-hmm. go, but it's definitely an interesting idea that adds to that whole resource scarcity feeling of right. you're constantly having to be on the lookout for ways to replace your weapons and armor. Right, right. Um, and that's a really interesting system that you can just say, this counts as some amount of scale, mm-hmm. and that's the most you're going to get out of it. Right, exactly. All right, so moving on here, Chapter 10, Treasure. Uh, so the initial parts, yeah. you know, just talk about, you know, how, you know, there's little, there's different... Uh, different coins which obviously you know that's a pretty easy uh, move forward to to fifth edition but then we get into magic items and so magic items i think uh how do you think you do it would you kind of use the old magic item tables or are you gonna like create a bunch of new ones well i wanted to backpedal for a second and mention that the dark sun treasure types in in chapter 10 use the old treasure type rules which says oh this type of monster in a layer has this class of treasure and you roll for the chance to have these things. And and then you get some percent of that treasure based on how many monsters there were in the lair as a percentage of how many could have showed up. Mm-hmm. Very complicated. Fifth edition <laughs> doesn't do that. It has a very straightforward sort of, here's the, a challenge rating of an encounter. Okay, you 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 fought a challenge rating three encounter. It has a chance to have some copper pieces or some silver pieces or maybe a couple of gold pieces. And uh, I think that that is likely to remain the same, that they'll just say, Roll on the same tables that that you use for treasure by challenge rating, but instead of getting gold pieces, you get ceramic pieces. Mm -hmm. But an an interesting thing that never cropped up really in in this system or in the 5th edition system is the idea that in Dark Sun, mundane equipment is really valuable. Just having a, a good bone sword is serious business, and that should really be counted as treasure. But that's always been sort of elided. Like, all the encounters, it's, oh, you you fight a bunch of templars and minions and they're using bone long swords and wearing bone scale armor that's some good stuff you don't need to give any more treasure than that yeah that's a that's definitely a good point and and i think that would be an interesting direction to take the dark sun treasure tables to say okay here's you know individual coin rewards but also taking into account all right what sort of gear are your players going to recover from these enemies and that that Mm -hmm. is also a part of your treasure allotment yeah, my players are fond of asking, you know, every every Templar they see, does he have a gold? Does he have a metal a metal weapon? Does he have a metal weapon? <laughs> there was a a game I'm I'm in where a Thrykreen character literally like butchered a human opponent that the team had killed, not just for the meat, but to use the femurs as clubs, bone club. <laughs> nice. So moving on here, we've got uh, you know they talk about magic items and sort of like the the details of some of them, like a potion of giant uh, control effects in right. a giant. So some of that stuff would definitely, you know, need to be updated a bit. Uh, they talk about which magic items don't exist. I think we would see some of that as well, like a potion of dragon control, although the, I don't think we have that in 5th edition, but that would not be a good thing for Dark Sun. Yeah, I, I suspect <laughs> that the 5th edition, a 5th edition treatment of Dark Sun from Wizards would probably say, okay, here's how potion fruits work and have botanical enchantment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Here's magic items that don't really fit the the motif of the setting right and uh i suspect there will probably be something along the lines of uh, a rule or a sidebar somewhere that talks about okay in the original dark sun setting these things didn't work or didn't fit and they did just didn't exist and if you really want to play uh, a stringent game by the numbers then you take those things out but not everyone's going to want to do that it's sort of like is someone out there going to want to play a half giant wizard? Yeah, probably. <laughs> and in fifth edition, ostensibly you can do that, yeah. but they could very easily have some sort of sidebar that says, you know, originally there were these sorts of limitations. And, and if you want to play with a limited palette, like a painter who's decided I'm just going to use these colors, then you can get an interesting campaign with these limitations. And the same sort of, of direction could apply to magic items. Like, okay, maybe your campaign, you have a decanter of endless water. I, I have a game I'm running where the PCs actually got one, but they <laughs> didn't get it until 17th level. Mm-hmm. So at that point, water's kind of a solved problem. Right, yeah. But they, they could very well say, sure, you can have these things if you want, but maybe they don't fit the, the themes of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting about 
you know, there's a few new magic items here that, you know, we would definitely kind of need to pull forward that are interesting. You know, Amulet of Sonic Interference. Tree of Life. Uh, yeah, Tree of Life. Yeah, Ring of Life, Oil of Feather Falling. Those are, you know, have cool effects uh, and why you need them for the world. Uh, one of the things that's not included here, which is interesting, is that there's no psionic items included here. And they were sort of like a little bit included in the, you know, the complete Psyonix handbook. Mm-hmm. And they were, you know, slightly different than magic items. But I feel like depending on how Wizards ends up handling psionics, maybe they would just be themed magic items. Yeah, I think that's likely. The other possibility is they might go sort of the third edition route. In second edition, all psionic items that you created with the Empower science are intelligent mm-hmm. and you oh, often right. yeah, have multiple right. powers because you, you put different powers that you know into them. And then they have their mm-hmm. own PowerPoint pool. And the major advantage is like, oh, I've got an intelligent staff that knows ballistic attack and has its own PSPs, so I don't have to use my turn to punch someone telekinetically. The staff will do it for me while I'm doing something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really sort of took out the idea of, well, what if I have an item that just, I've taken a sword and psionically made it super sharp? You could sort of do that with molecular manipulation or Mm duodimensional blade, but you couldn't make those permanent, really. In third edition, you could. You could make psionic items that mirrored magic items it's like this is a plus one sword except it was made by a scion instead of a a wizard and i suspect that that's probably not far off base the idea of okay yes you can have a plus one sword that was made by a psionicist instead of a wizard or a cleric and and it's not a big deal yeah and and that of, of course opens the door also for psionicist characters to have something else to do to pursue that sort of special knowledge how do i make this Mm -hmm. for sure all right, moving on here, we get into uh, chapter 11, which is encounters, kind of talking about the different monsters and kind of encounters yeah. in city-states and whatnot. It talks about which monsters are sort of appropriate from the other uh, monstrous compendiums, and I think you know a lot of these can just be moved forward. Obviously, there's some monsters that probably don't have um, mm-hmm. don't have fifth edition conversions yet, but uh, the cool ones, uh, you know, that are that feel really dark sun, I think would be right. might be moved over depending on you know who's who's doing it do you think there is a you know let's kind of get into monster talking about monsters a little bit more because sure. we, i don't think we really did it before what do you think is there a difference between monster design in fifth edition versus prior editions and specifically obviously dark sun uh well a lot of fifth edition monsters have gone back to a sort of a, a second edition feel in that they're very self-contained that a monster mm-hmm. has a stat block and if you know what this stat block is then you know what the monster does third edition and to some degree fourth edition weren't quite the same because often they would say okay this monster has all the powers of a third level wizard and so now you have to know what a wizard can do and to know what a wizard can do you have to know all of the spells that that wizard is capable of using and this is a a huge amount of overhead for a dm to to figure out Mm -hmm. whereas if you are looking at the stat block for a hobgoblin in fifth edition it has a couple of special abilities baked in It's got its martial superiority, so it can hit you for a whole ton of damage and just drop your fighter in the first round. And uh, and that's it. it, There's none of the, this works like a fifth level fighter. Instead, every monster is a self-contained piece of data. And if you have that three by five card with the monster on it, you have everything you need in order to run that monster. And this is a big, I think, part of the design principles of fifth edition is a lot of self-contained material. Things where if you have this particular puzzle piece, you don't have to add on a whole framework in order to support it. An an example of that is in the recent Unearthed Arcana that Jeremy Crawford and Dan Dillon did with the Psychic Warrior and the Soul Knife and the Psionic Wizard for 5th edition, where each of those classes had its own set of self-contained mechanics. So instead of going to the Psychic Warrior and saying, now you pick two powers from this other table, this giant list of psychic powers, it's just at 5th level you get this thing, at 7th level you get this thing, and if, if you've got that subclass you know what it does, and if you want to have psychic warriors but not have soul knives, you can just plop them in without having to add anything or remove anything else from the game and worry about it. It's totally self-contained. So the monster designs the same way. If you want to have a slig in your game, the slig has a stat block, it fits on a 3 by 5 card, has some sort of special abilities, and that's how it works. And I would not be surprised if an eventual Dark Sun book takes the form of something similar to Curse of Strahd, maybe. If they went down that road, it would be Here's a Dark Sun campaign that will run you from level 3 to level 13, or whatever they choose. And here are some of the iconic monsters of Dark Sun, and they have about 
a dozen to 18 monsters that are in an appendix that have their own stat blocks. And each one has just got a self-contained block of, this is what this monster does. This is what it means to fight against a rampager. This is what it means to fight against a gift. This is what it means to fight a so oot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for the most part, I you know I agree with you, except for when spellcasters come into into play, and that's when you get the, you know, they can cast this many spells, and here's all their spells, and you know that was something that I actually liked in fourth edition. They could just kind of you know had that stuff laid out for you, whereas now you have to know the spell, and you know Jeremy Crawford has gone on, you know, on record saying like, well, if if all of these creatures have fireball, then Right. Anytime you run any of these creatures that have fireball, then you know what it does. To a point, that's true, mm-hmm. but also you still got to look up details, which is one of the things that I'm I'm not a fan of fifth edition, and obviously wasn't a fan of second edition about that. I really miss the 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 fourth right, edition right. that that aspect from fourth edition. But uh, I don't know how you would do that, you know, with still having you know all of the options that that wizards or casters and and you know, frankly you know, psionic characters would have. Right. Well, I think that, that for monster stat blocks, what it'll come down to is like, oh, you're fighting a defiler. Here is our base defiler stat block, and it's going to be the equivalent of like a third level wizard, but he's going to have three, two or three powers, two of which he can use at will, and one of which he can use twice, and those are going to be pulled off of the spell list. And, it's, and then it, it'll just say in the block, okay, this is a thing the defiler can do at will. He can cast a firebolt, and it does make a spell attack roll. It does 1d10 fire damage. It's essentially the Firebolt cantrip, but they just keep a, a very simplified version of the text inside of the, the monster description. Yeah, that would be that would be nice. I don't know. You know I don't know if they would do that, because that's not sort of the way yeah, that they... I, I suspect that is a likely design as far as monsters are concerned. And then if you really want like the PCs to fight an enemy defiler who's a, a bad news problem with a custom spell list, then it's kind of on you to make that yourself. It's the same way in, in Core 5th Edition right now. If you want PCs to fight an enemy cleric or wizard who actually has all the powers of the classes that PCs have, you have to do your own design right, work right. on that because their their pre-made monsters are, are made to be a very simplified selection. This guy has these three powers. That's what he does. Right. So the next section talks about encounters. You know, that's pretty straightforward. The you know, There's no kind of definitive uh, encounter building or... or uh, encounter tables in dark Sun, or in um, fifth edition they just kind of tell you how to build them and that's basically what we've got here so i think that would all move forward pretty easily yeah. um the next chapter chapter 12 npcs so it just kind of talks about you know playing npcs one of the things that i love is that you know talks about the different levels of templar position so if you have yes. your low level templars what they do your mid-level templars the only thing that i always thought was kind of weird was low level templars one to four there was removers of waste on there and that just seems like I would say that's for someone that can kill you, you know, with a spell, I don't see them shoveling crap. <laughs> so that's interesting because this actually came up in a campaign that I'm running where uh-huh. in the bureaucracy in tier, it was set up so your high level Templars have major administrative positions and it trickles mm-hmm. all the way down to your your low level guys. Your first level dudes are literally things like the garbage man and the contractor who they are hoping that one day they will eventually be promoted up into the bureaucracy, but you know they're just getting their start, or they made too many enemies and are never going to advance, or whatnot, and so they're stuck in the bottom of the public works trenches. Mm-hmm. And it's literally these are the 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 folks who are doing all of the the dirty public jobs for the city that have to be done, and depending on the specifics of an individual Templar, maybe they're being forced to do it themselves because their superior hates them. Or maybe they actually have been allowed a small contingent of slaves that they can force to do all the dirty work for them. And they're purely administrative, yeah. riding roughshod on these things. Right, right. And another thing to think about that I just realized also was that, like, in second edition, first level Templars didn't even have spells. Right. So they were more like kind of warriors. So, yeah, that, that I guess that does uh, make sense. Yeah. Um, and so you have some Templars that are the, the militia. In Uruk, obviously, Templars are also soldiers. So the, the removers of waste cropped up in my game in tier because there was a, a Templar whose job was literally leading around this cart through the city where people had to dump their chamber pots every day because they would then collect <laughs> all of this on the slop cart and then they would take it out to the fields sure. and pour it out over there and then mm-hmm. slaves had to use right. that to fertilize the fields and there was a, a whole 
mini story arc that happened when one day the slop cart is going by where the PCs live in the Warrens and someone dumps a body in it. <laughs> yeah, so the idea of the, the Templar bureaucracy having these low people on the totem pole who have to do these terrible jobs for the public work services creates that sort of interesting political dynamic where every Templar wants to go up the ladder. Nobody wants to be doing these jobs, but they're being forced to either as punishment or with the promise that if they do a good job, they will eventually get promoted. Mm -hmm. And and the really evil Templars, of course, are scheming to kill their superiors and take their job. And then every Templar is looking at the PCs as this is some sort of outsider that I can lean on and use them to get what I want because I can threaten to arrest them or extort them or confiscate their goods unless they do what I want. For sure. And of course, uh, I, I wrote a mini adventure based on that called Bad Bits that I released on the Dark Sun Reddit and the Dark Sun Facebook group, where the whole mm -hmm. premise is that a, a mid-ranking bureaucrat basically frames the PCs for counterfeiting ceramic coins and then blackmails them and says, if you don't do these jobs for me, I'm going to have you thrown in the slave pens. And if you try to go to his superiors, they blow you off. They're like, we're important administrators with a real job to do. Get out of my office. So you've <laughs> got to find some way to make it so that this guy is more trouble for his bosses than it's worth for them to protect him. Nice. Uh, I want to jump back real quick. One of the things I meant to mention in Chapter 11 under the Encounters and Monsters was in 4th edition, one of the things that was interesting that people caught was that you know, gnolls were included in 4th edition. And they, to me, they make sense. I really like the idea of gnolls in Dark Sun. But in 2nd in edition, there were not any gnolls. They just kind of weren't there. You know, there was no there was no champion to kill them off. They just kind of weren't ever included. Just not what do you think addressed. about uh, that? Certainly the gnoll fits thematically as a, a scavenger species that's physically powerful and well adapted to the sort of savanna and desert climates. So the idea of Knowles being in Dark Sun is one that, that isn't a big hurdle to get over. But I think that their absence in second edition probably comes back to the same uh, idea of, oh, well, most of the things that are common tropes in D&D &D just don't exist here. There are no orcs. There are no mm -hmm. hobgoblins. There are no pixies, no trolls. And so uh, some of them got exhaustively enumerated as being wiped out by the genocidal champions. Mm -hmm. uh, others did not. Yeah. Um, I suspect that there's, you know, if you look at the, go back and you look at the list of monsters that appear in Dark Sun from other monster manuals, there's a bunch of other omissions, like there's no trappers or cloakers, mm -hmm. but no one went out and committed genocide on those things. There's no beholders, <laughs> and those are definitely intelligent creatures, but same deal. So there uh -huh. there was not a, a champion to yeah. kill those. So I think there's, there's probably a, a large range of critters that just were excluded in second edition by on the basis of all the monsters here are weird and then in fourth edition it was sort of like uh gnolls occupy an interesting niche that sort of fits the the theme and the climate well, why not have them yeah for sure cool all right uh moving on uh chapter 13 just a little bit about vision and light yeah, you know that's pretty straightforward you know, about sandstorms i think that's all yeah pretty straightforward chapter 14 time and movement you know we get into the uh the athesian calendar Messenger. um the years you know that's all setting kind of stuff we talked about dehydration um last time when we talked about survival and whatnot but what are your uh, what are your thoughts on water consumption and also you know it's kind of pretty glossed over this is what we talked about last time in that survival is pretty simple foraging is pretty simple but one of the things you mentioned is you know the survival theme uh, how do you kind of hold a survival theme without saying right you know track your water or do you do that well, I, I do track water, but the way that I do it is that I I went to a pet store and I bought one of those bags of little glass marble bead type mm -hmm. things, blue ones that you can put into a fish tank. Uh, it's like three bucks and has 50 of them. And then I just give those to my players and each bead represents half a gallon of water. And the reason that I do this is several fold. One, it's like, okay, this is putting it front and center. This is important. You have to pay attention to it. Number two, you put your, your beads on the table in front of you. I can look at a glance and see what the party's water situation looks like. And I can go, okay, they're about to start hitting the dehydration rules. Do I want to pump the brakes or do I want to hit them with this? 
And number three, it's tactile. It's like the difference between spending money on a credit card versus spending dollars in your wallet. There's right. been studies on this. Spending dollars on your wallet, it's harder, mm-hmm. especially as you get lower. You really <laughs> feel I'm running out. And so making those players give up those beads really feels harsh and, and it underscores like you've only got this limited resource and you're going to run out how much have you got in your hand you've got three beads left that's a day and a half you can stretch it a little more if you've got the right skills but good luck mm-hmm. oh you just encountered a bunch of npcs who are dying of thirst in the desert and your character is neutral good what do you do yeah yeah nice and, an interesting note is that fifth edition's got this silly little gap that has never been seriously answered by the designers that a day of rations in the equipment section weighs two pounds, but in the food and rest and travel section, of it says you need one pound of food a day. Mm. So I guess everything is like individually packaged almonds or something. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, never, never knows that. That's cool. The bigger hurdle actually is 5th edition has rules for survival that are pretty permissive, mm-hmm. especially when you have the Outlander background. Yeah. The Outlander has a specific feature that lets them feed and support right. a small group of people automatically. Mm-hmm. So if you have two characters who have the Outlander background in your group, then that sort of resource starvation is a non-issue. Right. And there's a couple of ways that you can approach that. One is you can change the background so it works differently. You can say that that background doesn't exist, but that it seems to make sense, the idea of I came from some tribe in the wastes and our village was destroyed by raiders and now I have arrived in the the great city state to make my fortune. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're an outlander. But it's terrain dependent. The DMG in 5th Ed is pretty explicit that if there's nothing to forage, then you get nothing. So if you're out in sandy wastes or, you know, elements help you on the deadlands on the obsidian plain, there may just not be anything for you to get. And that's down to what did you bring with you and what can your clerics and druids create? Right, right. But again, like I mentioned before about the the decanter of endless water, at 17th level, this becomes a solved problem. These sorts Mm -hmm. of problems are things that are interesting stressors to put on low-level characters. But ultimately, these sorts of environmental themes are are things that add stress to the other drama that's going on in the game. Like, I love doing the whole, you have to go from point A to point B. Now, you can join this caravan, and you can get there safely in eight days, or... You can cut across the desert on foot and you can get there in four days, but you've only got so many supplies and you're, you know, the thing that you're trying to get, the MacGuffin or the enemy at the end, if you take the whole eight days, might not be there or might be bunkered down and have gotten reinforcements. And so you have to make this hard choice of, do we take the safe route, but then the enemy might be gone or much harder to fight, or do we risk you know, tramping through the desert in a forced march without enough food and water and maybe getting hit by a sandstorm. All right, let's fight the bad guy. Everyone's got three levels of exhaustion because we haven't eaten in two days. <laughs> nice, yeah. Yeah, those are great choices. And, and you know, this gets into, you know, after the dehydration section, it gets into kind of movement, uh, movement at night, which is something you're going to want to do so you're not yeah. so uh, hot all day. You know, different terrain types, obviously that stuff can be pulled forward as far as like movement cost per terrain type mm. overland movements animals vehicles so all all this stuff i think is is pretty straightforward yeah yeah um you know kind of convert in one of my fifth edition dark sun encounters the pcs are fighting some giant scorpions out in the sandy waste and i just took the movement cost i'm like okay every square of movement is three squares of your speed so suddenly the pcs can move two squares and then attack and yeah. Uh, the scorpions, of course, are much faster and much better adapted to this sort of thing. And this just made people go like, oh, gosh, maybe maybe I should have a missile weapon. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's great that you're playing a half-giant gladiator who mashes things with his war club, but get a javelin, too. Yeah, if you can't get there, that's yeah. a problem. Definitely had encounters where they're just like, uh, I guess I'm waiting here. <laughs> so the next chapter is spells, and it goes into, um, you know, how, how to change spells specific darks and stuff like uh, find familiar and it gives a list of specific familiars although this um you know feels rather mundane compared to all of the you know all the monsters that have come out later that uh would be very useful in in, uh the third edition dark sun dragon magazine article they had a list of uh, more dark sun specific creatures to familiars so that you could have your you know your 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 psionic beetle or your weird vulture-like bird or your your tiny teleporting cat or what mm-hmm. have you. There's a second level wizard spell, Detect Psionics. 
what do you think about the sort of dichotomy of uh, magic and psionics? Uh, you know, that psionics and magic are different. Well, that gets to the, the harder question of yeah. do you have psionics magic transparency or not? Right. And from Watsi's perspective, purely as a business decision, it makes more sense for them to say psionics is a flavorful way to get to the same results that certain spells do. Mm -hmm. So if you use, you know, Claire Tangent hand in order to move something across the room, it is functionally the same as mage hand, but you're using psychic power. They've already done this a little bit, like with the, the Gith Yankee presented for fifth edition in Volo's guide, they yeah. have a race ability of doing mage hand, except when you do mage hand, you don't need any components and the hand is invisible. You're literally just using the force. It's supposed to be psionic. Right. And some of that makes sense, you know, with that, but the, you get into the issues of like, well, what if you have a uh, spell component costs and psionics doesn't have spell components? So what do you do? Like, right. do you just get a free ride on that? You know, that's a one of those questions. Also, things like one of the things that I always liked about mm -hmm. psionics and keeping it different um, was also just like how the powers work. So like, invisibility wasn't just like everybody like you're not just you don't become invisible you kind of cloud the yeah. minds of people around Only you the shadow so knows. somebody else comes into the area they you know they still see you so like that's one of the things i feel like is a, a major difference between psionics and magic that is i think in you know in danger of getting wiped out i uh, yeah certainly and I wrote a conspectus recently about the design challenges for doing psionics in fifth edition. Yeah, I'll, that was good. I'll link it when you post the, the podcast. Mm -hmm. And again, from a business perspective, Watsi's made it pretty clear that they're almost certainly not going to do psionics as its own sort of meaty system that a bunch of different character classes and monster types interact with. And the, the way I get that vibe is Jeremy Crawford explicitly stated in, in an interview that when we do new systems, nobody uses them. Yeah, and I suspect you know, there's there's a little bit of hyperbole. I used everything in third edition, <laughs> right. but uh, I suspect that what he's talking about is that if you look at third edition, not just the expanded psionics handbook, but things like Magic of Incarnum, Weapons of Legend, Book of Nine Swords, Tome of Magic, right. that sales on that were flat, mm -hmm. and a lot of those came out late in three point five when people kind of had fatigue on the line. Yeah, you know, exactly. you've got eighty books already on your bookshelf. Ugh, mm -hmm. I have to buy another book and another bookshelf, <laughs> but. Uh, Watsi wants books that will sell a million copies, not books that'll sell 2,500 copies. And Jeremy Crawford's looking at this and going, okay, if we release a new system that's a complicated system that you bolt on to the game, that's a 2,500 copy book. That's not what the, we want. And that's why we've been seeing these UA systems where it's, this is a psionic class and it has some psychic theme powers, but they're all very self-contained. If you've got the three pages for the psychic warrior, you have everything you need to know in order to run that class and drop it into any game. And I strongly suspect that that's sort of the direction that we'll see. Similar to how the Mystic is like much more complex and it gives you some choices. But once again, it's mostly self-contained. You have these powers or these powers or these powers. And that's what you get. And it's all in this write-up. Instead of saying, okay, you're a psionic class and the Divine Mind's a psionic class and the Ardent's a psionic class. And now here's a big list of powers, much like the spell system, except it's cast with PowerPoints and has these other distinctive things. Probably not going to see that. Good news, of course, is people will be more than happy to release such systems on DM's Guild. So if you really want that heavyweight distinctive psionic system, right. that's where th that's going to happen. But I, I would say, like, really high odds on yep. psionics in 5th edition will come out with some sort of Dark Sun book, and it's going to be largely self-contained in various classes. The psionicist will probably be a class, but it will also probably be okay, you use these spells, but when you use them, they are psionic, and that means they have these changes. Mm -hmm. You don't use verbal or somatic components. Yeah, it'll be more like the artificer. If it would normally require an expensive material component, they will figure something else out. Maybe it works like the Blood Hunter, and you spend a hit dice. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Uh, you know, there would definitely have to be some changes uh, to some spells, just like uh, right. create water. Yeah. You know, they talk about... It only creates a half a gallon, or in second edition, it created a half a gallon per caster level. Right. The sort of per caster level ideas have gone away, and now it's yeah. just like what level you cast it at. So, But I still think it would be reduced from the from the book. Absolutely. I think that there's basically a short list of spells, and I did this when I did my fifth edition games, of, okay, this spell works differently. In, in fifth ed, the basic create water spell makes 10 gallons of water. Just 
flatly that. And if you use a higher level spell slot, you make another 10 gallons. And that's partly because first level spells are usually more powerful in 5th edition than they were in previous editions. Like, if you look mm -hmm. at uh, Inflict Wounds, for instance, which <laughs> yeah. uh, is, what, 3, 2, 3? 3d10. 3d10. 3d10 damage. Yeah. That's pretty hefty for a first level spell slot. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Create Water become, you create 5 gallons of water. You're like, hmm. Some people don't like that. Uh, I was in one Dark Sun game where the, I was playing a water cleric, and the DM said, you cannot create water. And I'm like, why am I playing a water cleric then? <laughs> uh, my right. personal opinion is that people create characters, and when they engage with the mechanics, they do so to telegraph to you what kinds of problems they want to solve in the game. If you make sure. a half-giant who is a specialist with the mall, then you are telegraphing to the DM, my pr problem that I solve is when you need to hit something really hard and a lot. But right. if you play a cleric who creates water and you use your spell slots to do that, you're telegraphing, that's the problem I want to solve. For this group, water is a solved problem. And you're using a valuable resource. You're building a character around doing that. So why is it a problem to let people do that? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of uh, one of those things. Like, do you want, you know, if, if a DM is really like, I really want survival to be an aspect of the game, and somebody plays the water cleric, they just need to lean on other aspects of survival. So like, okay, you've got the water solved, but now you've got all these other things. And, and so if you do that, then like you can have the water solved for your party. But if you still want to make a story where water matters, then you do the thing of, I mentioned before, you meet a bunch of NPCs in the desert who are dying of dehydration and they beg for your help. And even if your party is not good, you can structure ways for them to do this where like, Oh, and these NPCs say that they came from a village that was recently sacked by one of the Sorcerer Kings. There's a great treasure, the treasure of the village. And if you save them and you promise to kill the, the minions of the Sorcerer King there, they'll lead you to it and give you the treasure. Okay, but we don't have enough water for all of these people. Even if the water cleric uses all of his spell slots, we got 20 mouths to feed. Now what do we do? You can always find a way to make that, that survival motif something that is going to stress the player's resources. Mm-hmm. So we are kind of, we're already at the hour mark. Oh no! Uh, there's, yeah. So it looks like we're not going to get to the fan questions yet. I'll actually put the, put out some more uh, calls for fan questions. Maybe we'll just come back and do just a whole Q&A thing. But there was one topic that I don't think we really touched on too much previously. Let's talk about that now. It has to do with this chapter as well. 10th level spells. You think we're going to see 10th level spells in uh, 5th edition Dark Sun? that's a toss-up on the one hand it does risk introducing the idea of here's something more powerful than wishes and how do you get a 10th level spell slot so that has to come into the rules for advanced beings mm -hmm. but on the flip side 10th level spells are ostensibly how you do all of your transformations but i could see them doing away with that just like psionics got rolled into the githyanki is just this is a racial power that lets you do these things and we flavor it as psionics mm -hmm. there could be epic boons or something of the sort that you take that then trigger that transformation and just sort of excise the whole concept of 10th level spells. I personally use them in my game. In the, the office game that I've been running, the PCs are currently the equivalent of about 23rd level. The um, Evangion is just started his transformation, and they do have a 10th level spell slot. And as per 5th edition rules, you can use that to cast a lower level spell and make it really, really bad news. <laughs> and there are specific psionic enchantments for them to use. I find that flavor really interesting. I have a suspicion that the WotC design team would look at this and go, what's the distinctive feature of these characters? It's not really the 10th level spells, it's the transformation. And so that's what they'll lean on, is there's Evangian transformation, mm -hmm. elemental transformation, dragon transformation, but they might not do it with spells. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. I would, I, th I think I'm going to say <laughs> Watsi is probably going to anger a lot of us and they're not going to do it at all. They're just going to make some monster NPCs with them because they, they've done so much research and people just don't play high level stuff. Uh, now, maybe that would be different for Darkson because that's a, a, you know, something that people know about it, but I don't know. Uh, I feel like, you know, in in fourth edition, they didn't have a problem sort of changing some of the flavor to meet uh, whatever their goals were, such as like yeah. elemental priests were kind of Seriously. downplayed immensely in fourth edition. I think they would, yeah, I feel like they're going to downplay advanced beings 
and we're going to see maybe maybe like you said maybe some boons that you know kind of give you those abilities but we're not going to see any any major major uh rule changes to encompass you you are right that they tend to be very averse to high level gameplay um partly because in earlier iterations of D&D, high-level gameplay was so cumbersome that very few people would tackle it. Fifth edition streamlined it down, and it's a little easier. There's still a lot to know, and it's a lot of work to get there if you don't start with a 15th-level character. Mm -hmm. And that's really supported by the fact that the epic boons in the DMG is literally like two pages. So you you might be very well onto something there. And that is another interesting niche that the DMs Guild even hasn't really filled is the idea of how do you make really good and interesting high-level adventures? And there's there's a couple of hurdles to that. In Dark Sun, one of the hurdles is the same as it is in all D&D games. The complexity of what your character can do becomes so high that combat slows down. Mm -hmm. People spend a lot of time thinking, oh, what's my best choice? I have so many options. And then, of course, the the issue of to really challenge a high-level character, oftentimes you want to engage that character's backstory. You want to do something that's important to that character and push them there, and that you you don't necessarily know. If you're writing a generic adventure, you don't know what people at home are, are deciding is right. important for their character. It, that's contingent on the DM to do in the moment. So, yeah. Yeah, for Adventures League, I wrote two Tier 4 adventures. One of them was a yeah. two-hour adventure, which was incredibly difficult to write. And then a four hour adventure and, you know, just just challenging those characters in that amount of time is really difficult. And so I think that previously Wizards has said, you know, most people play, you know, uh, up to fifth to 10th level. And then that's about where it peters out. And so that's why you yeah, see there's definitely a sort of sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why you see all their adventures being that. And that's why they want the DMs Guild to kind of fill that out for those people that you know that do end up getting at higher levels so and there's uh that bit about high level spells too where yeah. like you you'll notice that the number of spells per day you get drops off precipitously after fifth level and you get to the point where you only get one or two of each level of spells after that no matter how mm-hmm. high you go and uh there there was a, even a, a suggestion by watsi of maybe yeah. you just don't want to use these spells in your game and instead of giving people high level slots you give them extra low level slots and <laughs> and I think that speaks a lot to some people having trouble with the complexity or coming up with challenges that seem interesting to characters at that level. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we will call it there. Thanks a lot, Jesse. It has been uh, really great. Like I said, we will have fan questions in maybe another <laughs> follow-up Q&A. But it's been great uh, having you, Jesse. Um, so let's go ahead and wrap it up here. We'll talk about... Uh, Let's just say you can find me, Robert, um, on the Facebook group. There's a Dark Sun Facebook group. Come check that out. You can talk to, with me and other folks at arena.athos.org if you like the forums. There's a Dark Sun Discord, which I'm occasionally on. I'll put the link up for that. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Radu76. And if you want to come play some Dark Sun with me, you can come to my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Robert Aducci. And Jesse, where can we find you on the internet? Uh- been wonderful uh joining you on the podcast i uh tend to frequently lurk around the aforementioned dark sun facebook and and uh twitter groups or uh, uh sorry uh reddit groups and i will sometimes post about my thoughts on dark sun there and also on my twitter account which is just jesse heinig at twitter but um i uh also will post about my day job working for star trek online so i hope you're not averse to getting a, a face full of star trek if you come looking for dark sun as well <laughs> for sure jesse also you've got uh you got a website right trekhead something or other and i think that's where i kind of first heard about you you posted some really interesting um kind of blog posts about uh about running dark sun that's from my ancient 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 live journal and uh ah. it is trekhead uh over at live journal and, and those posts are still there and i have a tag dark sun for things that are interesting about dark sun and I'd be more than happy to sort of link a comprehensive dictionary of that. And I'm working on putting together a website where I can also keep all of my publications and ideas in one place. So if you're like, oh, I really like that that article you wrote of five new bard kits. Where is that? It can all be in one place. Nice, nice. Yeah, those are great articles. Definitely check them out. Jess has got a lot, of, a lot of great ideas, as you've heard today. So, Jesse, hopefully you can come back uh, another day. We'll talk about more Dark Sun and more Dark Sun and, you know, we have been previously kind of going over 
all different levels of Dark Sun. We kind of did an overview. We've done some deep dives. We did fifth edition. You know, so we've got lots of great ideas. There's so much content. You know, I'm sure we could have Dark Sun podcast forever, which hopefully we will. I sure hope so. All right. Thanks again, and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Stone and Obsidian is hosted by the Misdirected Mark Network, the media arm of Encoded Designs.